Hey, good morning. My name is Jasmine Dhaliwal, and welcome to Risk Management Professionals webinar series. Our producers, Oscar and Craig, will be keeping us operational in the background and taking questions. We're using a GoToWebinar interface to support our presentations. So if you experience technical difficulties, please contact our office at 877-532-0806. We have staff available to help with troubleshooting. The image sizes for the presenter screen and PowerPoint screen are adjustable. We also have a dialog box for questions during the presentation. So if you have any questions, please submit them in the question box. And after the presentation, we will include them in our question and answer session. So today I will be discussing how to incorporate inherently safer design into a hierarchy of hazard control analyses, which is a requirement for the new CALIP Program 4 regulations. Before I get started, here is a quick overview of our company and the types of services we can provide. The webinar series is part of RMP's ongoing outreach program. RMP's core competencies and expertise reside in EPA RMP, OSHA PSM, and CALIP program development and SEMS program development. We perform HAZOP and LOPA studies and other hazard identification techniques. And we have a variety of other process safety and regulatory standards and regulations presented on this slide. So today I'll first provide you with an overview of the CALIP program four regulations and hierarchy of hazard control analyses. And then we will delve into the concept of first and second order inherent safety measures and the methods to perform HCAs using inherently safer design. So if you are a refinery in California, I'm sure you are aware of the new CALIP regulations, which took effect last October and introduced the CALIP Program 4 requirements, which are specific to refineries in California. So as part of CALIP Program 4, several new elements were introduced to the program, including Safeguard Protection Analysis, or SPA, Damage Mechanism Review, DMR, Hierarchy of Hazard Control Analyses, or HCA, Process Safety Culture Assessments, PSCA, and Management of Organizational Change, MOOC, and more elements. But as part of today's webinar, we will focus on the Hierarchy of Hazard Control Analysis element, which is also referred to as HCA. So an HCA is an independent study that can be performed in tandem with your PHA and SP or LOPA studies to identify, analyze, and document all inherent safety measures and safeguards to reduce each hazard to the greatest extent feasible. It's beneficial to perform your HCA in conjunction with your PHA or SPA as the same team members are normally required, but also because HCAs are required to be performed every five years, which means they have the same cyclical cyclical requirements as PHAs. So all refineries are required to perform the HCAs for 50% of all existing new and modified units before October 1st, 2020, which is three years from the date the CALIP Program 4 regulations took effect. This includes units such as units with non-regulated or highly hazardous chemicals um, and units that don't have those chemicals as well, including your utility units, such as steam, nitrogen, instrument air, tank farm, wastewater treatment, plant, et cetera, in your refinery. So now that I've given you some background on HCAs, you may be wondering what triggers an HCA and how do you know when to perform one? Well, an HCA is required to be performed for all PHA scenarios that identify the potential for a major incident. This basically means PHA scenarios that have a high health and safety risk rank, such as loss of life, severe injury, lost time injury, et cetera. They're also required to be performed whenever you have a major change proposed at the facility. I know this seems vague, but a major change might be adding a new chemical to the refinery, installing a vessel that is not a spare vessel, so increasing your inventory at the refinery, or any change that introduces the potential for more off-site impacts. An HCA is also required whenever a major incident occurs. And by major incident, this normally means any incident equal to or worse than a lost time injury for an employee or for a contractor operating at your facility. So that would be considered a major incident. And finally, an HCA is required to be performed for um, 
during the design and review of new processes. So when performing an HCA, the information provided by the PHA, MOC, or incident, namely the process safety hazards from these studies, is used to identify, analyze, and document all inherent safety measures and safeguards to reduce each hazard to the greatest extent feasible. For each process safety hazard, the team shall first develop written recommendations to eliminate hazards using first order inherent safety measures. And then the team shall develop written recommendations to reduce remaining hazards using second order inherent safety measures. To explain first and second order inherent safety measures, this hierarchy of controls pyramid is helpful. The pyramid basically summarizes the effectiveness of safeguards. So in conventional hazards, hazards, hazards are mitigated or managed by safeguards, which are typically add-on safety devices and procedures. So when using the risk ranking matrix in the HAZOP, the severity must be evaluated based on the consequence, and the likelihood is typically reduced by adding these layers of protection or safeguards. So instead of considering your, typically, your typical add-on safety devices to reduce the likelihood, the HCA challenges the team to first consider inherently safer design alternatives. As this figure depicts, the most effective controls to reduce the severity of your consequence is elimination and substitution, which are inherently safer design principles. Elimination is considered a first order inherent safety measure, and that involves decreasing or eliminating the inventory of hazardous substances at your facility. This can be accomplished in a variety of ways that can lead to specific benefits for a plant. So benefits of minimizing a chemical in a process include a reduction in the total number of process operations, which can lead to fewer startup and shutdowns. Fewer process operations leaves less room for error and less cycling of equipment through startups and shutdowns. And another important benefit is that smaller inventories will lead to much smaller accidents. Moving further down the pyramid, substitution is considered a second order inherent safety measure. Substitution by definition involves substituting safer materials for hazardous ones. For example, this means avoiding highly reactive or flammable agents or trying to design the process using materials that require lower temperatures and pressures. Then this pyramid lists your more typical controls, which includes engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE. Engineering controls are third most effective control, which includes passive and active safety systems, such as dikes and berms, or pressure regulating or pressure relief valves. The next most effective control is administrative controls, which includes procedural protection layers. And finally, PPE is considered the least most effective control. So outside of elimination and substitution, other inherent safety design principles to consider in your HCAs are moderation and simplification. For moderation, which is also known as attenuation, this involves using hazardous materials but storing and processing them at least hazardous conditions. An example of this is storing chemicals as refrigerated liquids at atmospheric pressure instead of under, ambi under pressure at ambient temperature. This reduces the risks of overpressure scenarios and potential chemical releases or explosions. Another example is to store toxic substances in diluted solutions, like aqueous ammonia, which is used in many applications over anhydrous ammonia due to its inherent safety compared to anhydrous. Another inherently safer design principle for consideration in HCA is simplification. Simplification is the act of reducing process complexity. The benefits of this method are that the plant contains less equipment, simpler systems provide fewer opportunities for human error, they're typically cheaper than the complex processes because of the less equipment being used, valving and piping uh, that is needed is also less, and the plant will all, would be able to use less complex protective equipment for these processes. So now that we've reviewed the requirements and general definitions of HCAs, I will now review the various methods of performing HCAs and how to incorporate ISD principles I mentioned earlier to improve the safety of plants. So traditionally, the goal of a HAZOP is to identify hazards and mitigate or manage these hazards through safeguards, which are typically add-on safety devices and procedures. However, inherently safer design aims to eliminate or reduce hazards instead of managing and controlling them. So in order to make the most out of HCA, one method 
is to perform the HTA using the checklist methodology for an entire unit, which uses the ISD principles to identify opportunities to eliminate or reduce hazards within the unit. Alternatively, the HCA can be performed on high severity HAZOP scenarios. For this method, the HAZOP can be used as a tool to identify hazards and generate ideas for inherently safer design. So when using the risk ranking matrix in the HAZOP, as I mentioned earlier, the severity must be evaluated based on the consequence, and the likelihood is typically reduced by adding layers of protection or safeguards. Instead of considering your safeguards to reduce likelihood, the design team should first consider inherently safer design alternatives to reduce the severity of consequences. So this is really where you can begin brainstorming ideas for inherently safer design. A third record for performing HCAs is to perform the HCA on the PHA or SPA or LOPA recommendations. This means performing an HCA only for those recommendations associated with scenarios in the PHA or LOPA that identified a potential for a major incident. So this basically needs to be performed on recommendations that were made on scenarios with a high risk rank for safety or health or community impacts. So I'll, I'll go ahead and review each of these methods beginning with the unit-wide HCA checklists. So HCA checklists can be added at the end of HAZOP studies to stimulate thinking of inherent safety review for the overall plant or unit. Checklists are intended to promote out-of-the-box thinking and to generate ideas that might be usable in an existing facility or a plan of the future. These checklists should not be used in the rote yes or no manner, but the idea is to consider what might be possible and then determine what is feasible. Checklists should be reviewed periodically throughout the life cycle of the process, and if you're a refinery in California, you are required to review this checklist every five years to satisfy your HCA requirement should you choose to use HCA checklists to satisfy that requirement. These should be reviewed periodically because as technology changes, what was once impossible becomes possible and what was once infeasible becomes feasible. So here are examples of elimination or minimization checklist questions that can be used in your HCA. These questions can be rephrased to prompt maximum creativity such as using the wording how might it be possible to do the following instead of just stating, is this possible? Elimination and, minimiz elimination and minimization checklist questions include, is the storage of all hazardous gases, liquids, and solids minimized? Can equipment sets be combined to reduce overall system volume? Can pipeline inventories be reduced by feeding hazardous materials as a gas instead of a liquid? Are just-in-time deliveries used when dealing with hazardous materials? Are all hazardous materials removed or properly disposed of when they are no longer needed or not needed in the next however many days? Are attempts made to completely eliminate raw materials, process inter intermediates, and byproducts? Can process conditions be changed to reduce production of hazardous wastes or byproducts? So as you can see, these questions for the most part center around minimizing in-process inventories of hazardous raw materials, intermediates, and or finished products. Here are examples of substitution and moderation checklist questions. For substitution, uh, is it possible to substitute less hazardous raw materials? So for example, can non-combustible materials be used instead of flammable? Less volatile material be used? A less reactive material be used? A more stable material be used? And can a less toxic material be used? In refineries, this can be achieved by using sulfuric acid for the alkylation unit rather than hydrofluoric acid. Or if you have an SCR system, aqueous ammonia can be substituted for anhydrous ammonia. Another question is, is it possible to eliminate hazardous raw materials, process intermediates, or byproducts by using an alternative process or chemistry? Then is it possible to use utilities with lower hazards? For example, can low pressure steam be used instead of a combustible heat transfer fluid? Is it possible to substitute less hazardous final product solvents? So can a water-based product be used in place of a solvent or oil-based product? So as you can see, substitution checklist questions center around finding alternative chemicals or processes to completely eliminate the hazard. For moderation, checklist questions include, can potential releases be reduced via lower temperatures or pressures or elimination of equipment? So basically, can the process be operated at less severe conditions using any other route? For example, can design upgrades improve thermodynamic or kinetic efficiencies of reactor, like improved mixing or heat transfer? 
to reduce operating temperatures or pressures? Or can you change the order in which raw materials are added to reduce temperatures and pressures? Then is it possible to make reaction conditions less severe, like temperature, pressure, etc., by using a catalyst or by using a better catalyst? Or is it possible to dilute hazardous raw materials to re reduce the hazard potential? For example, can aqueous ammonia be used instead of anhydrous ammonia? Can aqueous hydrochloric acid be used instead of anhydrous? Can sulfuric acid be used instead of oleum? Can dilute nitric acid be used instead of concentrated fuming nitric acid? These are all questions you can post to the team depending on your chemical. Another question is, all, are all hazardous gases, liquids, and solids stored as far away as possible to eliminate disruption to people, property, and the environment in the event of an incident? So this is to avoid knock-on or domino effects if you have an incident at the refinery. Overall, moderation checklist questions aim to lessen the hazard potential by changing operating conditions, chemicals, or the locations of those chemicals. Finally, here are examples of simplification checklist questions to be included in your HCA. Are equipment and procedures designed such that they cannot be operated incorrectly or carried out incorrectly? For example, can displays be simplified? Is valving, piping, or hoses designed to prevent connection error? Can vibration be reduced with better equipment? Is the use of open-ended valves minimized at your facility? Can the number of connections and paths be reduced? Another question is, are all our machine controls located to prevent unintentional activation while allowing easy access for stopping the machine? Are all manuals, guides, and instructional materials clear and easy to understand, especially for those that are used in an emergency situation? For example, can procedures be simplified by reducing excessive reliance on human action to control the process? Can equipment be eliminated or arranged to simplify material handling? For example, can equipment be gravity fed instead of using pumps? Can congestion of equipment be reduced? Can flow paths be shortened at your facility? Or can distributed control system modules be, sim be simplified or reconfigured such that the failure of one module does not disable a large number of critical control loops? But as you can see, simplification checklist questions aim to simplify equipment, procedures, and controls. This figure shows a template example of how to use the checklist questions I mentioned earlier um, in your HCA, so how they can be incorporated into your HCA worksheets. So first, the facilitator asks the question of the checklist listed in the question column, and then the team brainstorms potential opportunities to implement the inherently safer design for the overall unit. Next, the feasibility of incorporating the inherently safer design option can be discussed and documented in the feasibility columns. So that basically asks, is this possible for your plant? Is this feasible without introducing additional hazards? The ultimate potential consequence related to the checklist question is recorded in the consequence column, and existing safeguards are documented, which are risk ranked. The recommendations column is used to address specific consequences by considering your inherently safer design. So for this example, the unit being considered is the tank farm or storage of chemicals and bullets near the unit. In the first column, the question is introduced, can hazardous raw materials inventory be reduced? This uses an elimination or minimization checklist question. Then the potential inherently safer design opportunity is brainstormed to lower storage tank volume or eliminate storage if possible in the potential opportunities column. Next, the feasibility of lowering storage tank volume further or eliminating storage is examined. And in, and in this example, the team discussed that it is feasible for one storage tank to be eliminated. Then the worst case scenario or consequence of having large amounts of hazardous raw materials inventory is discussed. And the consequence is that there could be a rele potential release from storage resulting in a vapor clouded explosion. The severity of this consequence is ranked in the severity column. Then the current safeguards are listed, such as administrative controls to limit level in the tanks. The likelihood of the consequence considering these safeguards is ranked, producing a risk ranking. And the final item is a recommendation, which is based off of your inherently safer design brainstorm. This is when you evaluated potential opportunities and then determined their feasibility at your plant. So for this example, the recommendation is to eliminate one of the five flammable storage bullets to reduce 
potential releases from storage, which uses the elimination or minimization inherently safer design principle. Um, so that basically confused how checklist questions can be used in HCAs to encourage inherently safer design consideration. Next, I will discuss an alternative method to incorporate inherently safer design into HCAs by using an existing HAZOP or building off of your traditional HAZOP study to brainstorm ideas for inherently safer design. So specifically, the next method uses high severity HAZOP scenarios to perform the HCA. So instead of applying inherently safer design at the overall process levels or unit level as we discussed for HCA checklists, Using the HCA for high severity HAZOP scenarios allows the team to brainstorm inherently safer design at the node level. This method involves first performing your HAZOP as usual and then revisiting the high severity scenarios of your HAZOP and performing HCAs for just those scenarios. So this presents an advantage because when you're examining HCA checklists at the overall process level, the opportunities for inherently safer design may seem limited as the overall process is simplified and stimulating ideas for inherently safer design prevents more of a challenge for the facilitator. But if the study is conducted at the detailed node level, as you would for high severity HAZOP scenarios, additional considerations are given to smaller but more important details. For example, at the macro level, it may appear that the hazardous chemical in the process cannot be substituted, but on a micro level, there may be opportunities to do so at given areas or items of equipment. Therefore, it's advantageous to use this approach to examine each node within the HAZOP study rather than examining the process as a whole. So for this method, instead of leading with the checklist questions to brainstorm ideas for ISD consideration, this method uses a traditional HAZOP study to identify the high severity scenarios, and then the facilitator sets a safety objective such as elimination, substitution, moderation, or sim simplification. Those are your ISD principles. So this figure shows a template example of how ISD strategies can be incorporated into the existing HAZOP study worksheets for your HCA. The hazard evaluation team reviews the cause, consequence, and existing safeguards developed during the tra traditional HAZOP study. And then the team identifies possible opportunities for eliminating the hazard or reducing the risk through ISD strategies, which is docu documented in the opportunities column. Feasibility of the ISD strategy is documented in the feasibility column. And potential recommendations are documented in the recommendations column, considering your four ISD strategies, elimination, substitution, moderate, moderation, or simplification. The potential recommendations that may address the concern are listed in order of first order inherent safety measure, which is elimination, second order inherent safety measure, which is substitution, and then engineering or administrative control recommendations are listed last. So for this example, or in this figure, the process node is feed to the reactor. The first row identifies the cause as high water content in the feed tank, and the consequence is documented as excess water in the reactor may lead to shorter run life due to catalyst fouling. And the worst case scenario is that excessive water may cause a runaway reaction. The safeguards for this consequence include operator monitoring of process conditions. This is where the team can brainstorm ISD alternatives to relying on an operator monitoring the process conditions. So in this case, the concept of elimination is used to avoid a hazard. And the opportunity arises to evaluate a way to eliminate water from entering the reactor rather than using controls, rather than relying on your continuous operator monitoring. The team then examines whether it is feasible to eliminate water from this process and documents it may be feasible to switch to a clean tank without the potential for water introduction by making minor piping changes. Thus, the recommendation is to change the feed to the reactor from the tank that currently has high water settlement to a tank that has a clean feed stock. So that concludes how to perform HCA on high severity HAZOP scenarios. The final method for performing HCAs includes performing it the HCA or PHA SPA um, on your PHA SPA recommendations rather than for entire high severity HAZOP scenarios. So performing a HCA for PHA or SPA recommendations only may limit the number of scenarios for evaluation. So earlier we talked about performing a HCA for high severity HAZOP scenarios, which may be abundant in your PHA. You might have scenarios with lots of A or B 
um, severity risk rankings. However, performing HCA for only the PHA or SPA recommendations that were made on those scenarios with the potential for a major incident, so those scenarios that have a high risk rank for safety, health, or community impacts, that can really streamline the number of scenarios for consideration. So for this method, the idea is to perform your PHA and SPA as usual, and then filter out the recommendations made for your high severity scenarios. So this figure shows a template example of how to perform HCA on the PHA or SPA recommendations while considering your ISD design principles. So first you lead with your recommendation and have the associated risk rank which prompted the recommendation. Next you brainstorm alternative options for the recommendation in the alternative HCA options for recommendations column. This column prompts the team to consider first the first order inherent safety measures using the elimination ISD principles, then the second order inherent safety measures using the substitution ISD principle, then passive mitigation measures, active mitigation measures, and finally procedural steps um, to replace or further enhance the recommendation. Next, the team considers the feasibility of each HCA option you discussed in the previous column in the feasibility review for proposed HC options column. So here the, the team provides the rationale or justification for accepting or rejecting the HCA option you, performed, you brainstormed earlier. So based on the feasibility review, the team documents whether the HC option was accepted or rejected in the accepted column. And finally, the team re-risk ranks the scenario with the accepted HCA option in place. So for example, in this scenario, the recommendation is to consider installing a low flow alarm on the discharge of your LPG pump to alert operations at the control room upon low flow from the pump. The concern is potential blocked in discharge of the pump leading to pump deadhead and potential seal failure, resulting in a release of light hydrocarbons with fire explosion hazard if an ignition source is found. So the severity is B, one fatality or severe injury, and the risk rank is a two. So since the recommendation is to add a safety feature, it does not consider ISD alternatives to mitigate the hazard. So the next column prompts the team to think about inherently safer design alternatives to the recommendation using first order and second order inherent safety measures. So in this case, a first order inherent safety measure would be to eliminate the hazard by considering using gravity flow instead of an LPG pump. Then the team considers the feasibility of this. Can this be done? Um, in the feasibility review column. And the team determines that gravity flow is physically impossible for the operating conditions of the unit. Thus, it is rejected. Then the team moves on to considering second order inherent safety measures, which would be substitution. So the team considers using sealless pumps um, instead of using your, your regular LPG pump but determines that this is not feasible as sealless pumps or mag drive pumps are not available for high temperatures and high pressure conditions necessary for LPG. So thus, this option is also rejected. Next, the team considers passive mitigation, such as installing a secondary containment box around the pump. However, it notes that installing a secondary containment box would present additional safety hazards for maintenance personnel, and thus this option is rejected. Next, the team considered active mitigation, such as equipping the pump with dual mechanical seals that alarm upon primary seal leak or failure. The team considers this feasible as dual mechanical seals comply with industry best practice standards and it is accepted as a HCA option. And finally, the team considers any procedural steps to prevent the hazard and then they consider implementing additional restrictions for vehicle access and personal entry into the area per procedure to reduce ignition source probability and minimize time spent by personnel in the area. But it's determined that this may not be effective to mitigate the risk gap in this scenario, and thus this is also rejected. So lastly, the team re-risk ranks the scenario considering the dual mechanical seals, your accepted HCA option, is implemented. And that reduces the likelihood and overall risk rank to three, which is acceptable. For this example, although your first or second order inherently sa inherent safety measures were not implemented, it is important to evaluate those options first and consider their feasibility before moving on to your other controls. 
such as passive, active, and procedural controls. So that concludes our webinar, Incorporating Inherently Safer Design into HCAs. I have reviewed three different methods of performing HCAs using ISD, including unit-wide HCA checklists, evaluating high-severity HAZOP scenarios, and performing HCAs on just the PHA or SPA recommendations. So here are the references used to create this presentation. And we have a variety of webinars and conferences coming up, including the 2018 RITA National Conference in November, which is in Dallas, Texas. Um, Stephanie Smith and Ryan Bray will be presenting at that conference, so feel free to say hi to them if you're there. And we have a webinar coming up in winter of this year presented by John Johnson covering NFP and API standards for gas-fired heaters. We'll also be present at the 2018 IIR National Conference in March of next year in Phoenix, Arizona. And we'll also be present at the 15th Global Congress on Process Safety in New Orleans. So if you're attending either event, feel free to visit our booth. And now I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Just as a side note, the audio and PowerPoint presentation are being recorded and will be available for viewing in about a week. OK, so here's one question. Uh, you mentioned that ACAs can be performed in tandem with PHAs. So you can have the same team present outside of your regular PHA team with operations, maintenance, instrumentation, and personnel, et cetera. Who else, um, who else's participation would be beneficial? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so I think the best group for consideration in your HCA would probably be someone from your capital projects group or your, if you have technology subject matter experts it would be beneficial because they can really evaluate the feasibility of um, the HCA options you're proposing because they'll be in charge of those projects in the future. Um, so I would say anyone from capital projects or um, a technology subject matter expert would be beneficial for your HCA. Another question is, uh, I recall you saying that 50% of all existing new and modified units in the refinery need to have an HCA performed before October 1st, 2020. What about the rest of the units at the refinery? Sure, yeah. The, so, yeah, 50% of all new existing or modified units need to be performed by October 1st, 2020. But the rest of the units um, need to be performed within five years of the date the CalArt Program for Regulations took effect. So that would be October 1st, 2022. Um, and then again, I know um, you're used to performing PHAs on just the units at the refinery with highly hazardous chemicals. But as part of the HCA requirement, this applies to all units at the refinery. So that includes your utility, wastewater treatment, um, nitrogen air, every, all units at the refinery need to be performed by October 1st, 2022. All right, any other questions? That'll be it. Okay, well, thank you for joining me uh, on this webinar, and if you have any other questions, you can feel free to email me. Okay, thank you, everyone.